Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marguerite Chapman and I'm a master's student at the University of Oxford. It is with great pleasure that I begin this memorial lecture by honoring the inspiring legacy and illustrious career of the man himself, Georgi Arkadia Arbatov. Mr. Arbatov embodies what we, as the future generation bearing the responsibility of the Russia-West relationship aim to one day achieve, enhanced mutual understanding translated into constructive foreign policy. More than anyone, Mr. Arabatov understood the immense value of communication as the basis for any stable and constructive bilateral relationship. After serving in the Red Army during World War II, for which he was awarded the Order of the Red Star in 1943, he graduated from the Moscow Institute of International Relations in 1949 and received his PhD there in 1954. Between 1953 and 1963, he worked as a journalist and commentator on foreign affairs for communist and the English language publication, The New Times. Between 1963 and 1964, he worked at the Institute of Global Economics of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. And then from 1964 to 1995, he was founding director of the Institute for US and Canadian Studies. From 1964 to 1967, he was also appointed advisor to the Central Committee of the CPSU on US matters. As an advisor to five communist party general secretaries, he was frequently involved in negotiating arms control and various bilateral agreements of lasting significance today. In an interview in 2008, he emphasized the importance of these discussions and I quote, we need negotiations all the time. If you do this, you become interested in the other country. You meet your adversary regularly and you get to know him. He was one of the first Soviet officials to reach out to government, industry, and academia in the United States, creating an unprecedented platform for constructive communication, and through his diplomatic skills succeeded in cultivating ties based on mutual respect with many of the staunchest hardliners in Washington. Mr. Arbatov attained prominence by acting as a bridge between the superpowers at a time when they were divided by suspicion, misunderstanding, and often outright hostility. Not only was he responsible for fostering dialogue and understanding at the bilateral state level, but he also acted as an intermediary within the Soviet Union itself. In his 1992 memoir, The System, An Insider's Life in Soviet Politics, he explained that the profound changes adopted in the late 1980s by Gorbachev were largely possible because of people who had worked from the inside and not from outside the system. Indeed, he was fearlessly committed to representing, serving and improving his country in spite of all obstacles. His intellect, creativity and sophisticated knowledge of the US redirected the internal political consciousness of the Soviet Union towards pragmatism based on the global reality of the moment. He was equally forward-looking and from the 1960s onward created a cadre of individuals committed to studying the US seriously, people who remain influential proponents of enhanced dialogue and cooperation. Today, more than ever, as US-Russia relations appear to have reached the lowest point in decades, we have much to learn from his legacy. Thank you. I will now give the floor to Alex Carlier, who will introduce the speaker. Thank you, Marguerite. Uh... My name is Alex Carlier, a student of international policy at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. Uh, today, our speaker is Dr. Alexei Arbatov, who is the head of the Center for International Security at the Primakov National Research Institute of World Economy and International Relations. He is also currently he also currently serves as a member of the Scientific Advisory Council to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, as well as the Russian International Affairs Council and the Council on Foreign and Defense Policy. Dr. Arbatov has participated as a member of official delegations to various arms control negotiations, including those for START-1. In 2011, he was elected as a full member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Recognized internationally for his expertise on international security issues, Dr. Arbatov will be speaking with us today on the very timely and important topic of nuclear deterrence and strategic stability, a controversial symbiosis. Uh, Dr. Arbatov, thank you. So what next, shall we proceed? Yeah, well, uh, thank you to both of you for your very kind introductory statements on my father and also about myself. Um, and uh, also my 
thanks go to uh, Professor Anna Vasilyeva, who has been pursuing with this uh, project for many years and uh, uh, keeps memory of my, of my father alive. Uh, I, I can say how much I appreciate. Thank you. Now about the uh, about my presentation, I will I have some powerpoints here. I will try to bring them to to the screen. If it doesn't work, you just tell me. Okay. Uh, let us start. Um, in the ideal world, nuclear deterrence and strategic stability are two sides of the same coin. Nuclear deterrence theoretically is designed to prevent aggression by threat of nuclear retaliation. Strategic stability is designed to prevent aggression with removing incentives for a first nuclear strike, which may be the beginning of a nuclear aggression. Uh, so to put them together, in one package, we can say that strategic stability is a state of mutual nuclear deterrence, which excludes incentives and possibility of deliberate uh, nuclear aggression, and thus remove the possibility of nuclear war. But in the real world, situation is very, very different from that ideal model. Um, let me say a few words about one interesting episode. When I was deputy chair of the defense committee in Russian Duma, uh, in 2001, uh, with a group of deputies, I visited, um, it was one of many visits to strategic rocket bases uh, in Russia. And there, a young officer was praised and rewarded for his excellent service. Certainly, this event was specifically arranged for the, for the, was it for the time of the visit of members of parliament. And the officer, in response, said, we're simply fulfilling our duty because we understand what, we, what would happen if our missiles would not be launched. After that, after dinner, I came to him and privately asked him, uh, and in fact, what would happen if your missiles are not launched? And he responded, we would not be able to destroy targets assigned to our missiles. Then I persisted saying, but do you understand that the moment your missiles are launched will be the moment that you failed in your principal mission, deterrence and prevention of war. Your missiles would punish the aggressor, but would not save Russia from devastating nuclear strike, from destruction. Certainly the young officer was confused, but very quickly he found a way to respond. And he said, like any other young officer, at Russian or American missile base probably would respond. He said, we are, doing, we are doing what we are trained to do. All other questions up, are up to political leaders to resolve. And that was right. But this episode brought me to, uh, to a thought that without knowing it, inadvertently, this officer disclosed two principal contradictions of nuclear deterrence. One contradiction is that, that nuclear deterrence is not contained by one side's nuclear forces. They are living in the minds of the opponent, in particular in understanding by the opponent of circumstances under which the other side might use nuclear arms. If that understanding is absent, whatever forces you have, however powerful and effective they are, they will be not able to provide nuclear deterrence. And unfortunately, both Russia and the United States and most other nuclear weapon states 
insist that in their nuclear doctrines, it is necessary to preserve a big uncertainty so that effective is more effective, so, so that deterrence is more effective. If the other side does not know uh, very clearly when and how you may use your nuclear weapons, deterrence is enhanced. I think the effect is just the opposite. If the other side does not understand it very correctly and very precisely, deterrence may fail in a crisis situation. Another principle, contradiction of nuclear deterrence that was also uh, disclosed unwillingly by that young officer is that despite the fact that all nuclear weapon states officially claim that their nuclear arms serve the goal of deterrence, deterrence capabilities rely only on systems and operational plans of nuclear war fighting. Without plans of actually using nuclear weapons, deterrence cannot work. And this border between deterrence and war fighting is very artificial. In practical life, it is blurred. And the dynamics of arms race and evolution of nuclear doctrines is blurring more and more this line between theoretical deterrence and practical nuclear war fight. Uh, one might say, OK, let us assume that deterrence means retaliatory strike, second strike, while war fighting implies first strike or first use of nuclear weapons. That might be an elegant theoretical composition. But in fact, it is not working either. Because of the nine nuclear weapon states, seven, except China and India, it envision a possibility of first nuclear strike or first nuclear use in order to, to deter not only nuclear aggression, but also conventional aggression and other threats, and recently even cyber aggression, and the aggression with the use of other weapons of mass destruction. So in this sense, the, the threshold between nuclear deterrence and nuclear war fighting still further is blurred. Um, Moreover, the situation is even worse than I described because the boundary between second and first strike is also diluted by various concepts and weapon systems. In particular, by the concept of launch and warning. That is, you launch your missiles upon receiving the warning of attack by the, attack by the other side from early warning satellites and land-based early warning long distance radars. With the uh, short flight time of contemporary weapons, with the stealthy flight time, which, which shorter, shortens warning time, and uh, because of the capability of physical destruction and cyber attacks against command control and early warning systems, the time for decision making of a politician to implement launch on warning is shrinking to several minutes and, in some respects, even several seconds, which means that. There is no place for a political decision making. There is only place for automatic action according to uh, automatic uh, decision making algorithms and the signals which are automatically uh, interpreted uh, by computers. Uh, now, uh, more and more fashionable is artificial internet. And I am afraid that we are moving towards in artificial inf intellect as the final decision-making uh, body, which will decide on whether to launch nuclear weapons. Uh, still another important um, dimension of nuclear deterrence is connected to the concept of, and systems for limited nuclear war. They are becoming more and more pronounced in US-Russian strategic relationship. The reason probably, strangely enough and paradoxically, is that due to uh, deep reduction of nuclear weapons uh, in line with the treaties that we have signed during the last 30 years, the possibility of deliberate massive disarming nuclear strike is virtually um, absent. But under this uh, 
top level of nuclear interaction, the idea of limited nuclear war has acquired a new living. It was popular in the 60s, uh, in, in the late 50s, then somehow moved to the background. Now it is at the fore, foreground again. Uh, the United States are accusing Russia of the concept escalate to the escalate, that is to use nuclear weapons selectively in a local conflict to prevent uh, defeat by NATO superior conventional forces or to preserve gains initially uh, initially achieved uh, in the in the in the beginning stage of the conflict. Russia denies existence of such concept uh, and accuses the United States for its turn in developing ideas and systems for selective use of nuclear weapons against Russia in case the United States are not sure of its victory in a local or regional convention conflict. Uh, another headache uh, which existed for many decades for nuclear uh, planners and uh, strategic analysts is what do you do if really deterrence fails, if the nuclear war starts? Do you immediately commence with exchanging massive nuclear strikes or you do initially some selective nuclear uh, attacks uh, as a signal to the other side in order to try to limit damage to both sides and to end the war uh, before it escalates to a massive uh, exchange of nuclear strikes. From some point of view, that may be a reasonable thinking. But on the other hand, such thinking in and of itself um, makes use of nuclear weapons in a local conflict easier and increases the possibility of nuclear war escalating from conventional conflict because both sides would think that uh, this is uh, possible, this is a feasible uh, operation and will not necessarily lead to mutual total destruction. Uh, and finally, another important element of nuclear deterrence is the so-called entanglement of the new precision guided conventional systems, including hypersonic weapons uh, with uh, nuclear weapons uh, in technological and operational aspects. When I say technological, what I mean is that more and more systems are being developed and deployed, which are dual purpose systems, which can deliver nuclear and conventional warfare and which makes uh, it impossible to recognize whether the missile that is flying uh, on you is nuclear or conventional. You will only discover it when it explodes over your head. So that is certainly a recipe for very quick escal escalation of any conflict. Uh, due to technological progress and informational progress of, inf progress of informational systems, uh, uh, conventional long range uh, weapons have acquired possibility to perform tasks which formerly could be performed only by nuclear weapons. In particular, they gain more and more capability to attack nuclear forces of the other side. And that makes this entanglement uh, certainly uh, more and more uh, dangerous in a, in a crisis situation. I've already mentioned that uh, command and control systems of each other are, are becoming uh, targets for conventional attacks, for cyber attacks, which also is a part of entanglement of conventional and nuclear weapons. Initially, nuclear deterrence implied that nuclear threat may, may deter the use of conventional forces of the other side. Now, we see the integration of nuclear and conventional forces, which no longer make nuclear weapons uh, a reliable deterrent um, instrument uh, against uh, local conventional aggressions of the other side. And finally, defenses. Uh, nuclear deterrence, as you know very well, have put uh, this, the role of nuclear, de of nuclear defense uh, in a very different way that historically was the case. Uh, usually defense was considered moral and right, but under nuclear deterrence, uh, defensive systems, in particular ballistic missile defenses, 
are considered to be destabilizing because they provide for a possibility to protect yourself against the retaliatory strike of the other side. That is why we started nuclear arms control with signing uh, an anti-ballistic missile treaty in 1972, which provided for a quite significant measure of strategic stability during the next 30 years. Uh, since the United States withdrew from this treaty in 2002, we do not have it anymore. And certainly uh, now it is one of the principal apples of discord between Russia and the United States. Ironically, R Russia and the United States changed places in their attitude towards ballistic missile defense. The whole process of limiting them started with meeting of um, President Johnson and Secretary of Defense McNamara and Soviet Prime Minister Kasigan in Glasgow, uh, New Jersey, in, in 1967, where McNamara presented Alexei Kasigan with this logic of the stabilizing role of ballistic missile defense for nuclear deterrence. Certainly, Kasigan didn't understand anything about this uh, issue, and he said, uh, no, your proposal is unacceptable. We will not limit ballistic missile defenses. They are moral, they are to protect people. You have to limit and reduce offensive systems which are threatening um, the, 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 the life of the people. But very quickly, in about two years, uh, Soviet Union recognized the logic of McNamara and we had 1972 ABM Treaty. Now, we oppose different positions. The United States have adopted the concept of Alexei Kasigan and considers ballistic missile defense stabilizing, and Russia has adopted the concept of McNamara and considers those systems destabilizing. Certainly, if you are going into hair splitting, you may say that not all ballistic missile defenses are necessarily destabilizing. For instance, ballistic missile defenses to protect your retaliatory forces, in particular land-based missiles. They serve nuclear deterrence because they ensure your uh, retaliatory capability. Or if they protect your country from unauthorized accidental launches of ballistic missiles, or against third countries, rogue states, uh, terrorists in future. That is true. But it turned out that due to political and strategic differences, it proved impossible for Russia and the United States to agree on such delineation and such uh, definitions. And now ballistic missile defense is a serious problem for our relationship. Having said all that, I will make the first uh, preliminary con conclusion. My studies of nuclear deterrence, its logic, its controversies, make me believe that those, contra those contradictions of nuclear deterrence and the number of others which I didn't have time to mention are not possible. It's not possible to resolve them within the logic of nuclear deterrence. No possibility of resolving them within the logic which is imposing, um, w w which nuclear deterrence imposes on the minds of policymakers, military, and common public. The only way to get out of this vicious circle is to get into different to get out of the box, to get, to get into different plane. And this plane is strategic and in general nuclear arms control. Uh, the logic of nuclear, nuclear arms control uh, is uh, simple at first glance, but very uh, deep and, um, and, and, and interest, interesting with, uh, with more um, uh, Intrusive, with, with more persistent study. The logic is that despite the fact that your weapons are designed against each other and they are designed to inflict immense destruction on each other, you can agree to limit them on a reciprocal uh, basis. The paradox of this logic is that in fact, I agree to you having weapons which may destroy my country in response in exchange for your agreeing that I retain some weapons which can destroy your country. The benefit is that we uh, agree to remove those weapons 
or reduce those weapons, which are more likely to be used in the first nuclear strike. That is the whole sense and notion of, of strategic stability, which was agreed in a mutual uh, declaration by the Soviet Union and the United States in 1990. It was agreed in the course of negotiations of uh, START One Treaty, and I'm very proud that I was part of the group of negotiations, which among other th things in particular was for uh, negotiating to achieve the formula of this declaration, which lists the uh, essence of nucleus or of strategic stability as a state of strategic relationship, removing incentives for the first nuclear strike and lists the number of technical uh, conditions which are to be observed uh, to enhance strategic stability while reducing the numbers of strategic nuclear weapons. Of course, if you read the declaration, its style is a matter of compromise. Uh, it's not Turgenev. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult text, sometimes awkward text, but it's very important text because it was the first recognition by both sides that the other side is not necessarily wrong in having nuclear weapons. It may, it may have serious reasons to have them in order to prevent nuclear war, which may emanate from yourself. And so the other side is not wrong if only because it has a different political system or different international interests. It may be wrong if it is developing web weapons which are uh, to be used in initiating nuclear war. That was a, uh, it was 1990. Of course, Cold War was already uh, going away, but still it was a revolutionary breakthrough because communist Soviet Union, Gorbachev communist, but still communist, and capitalist United States of America under President Bush this, uh, junior or senior, um, recognizing the right of the other side to have nuclear weapons of its own for justifiable uh, stabilizing purposes. Uh, other important elements of uh, strategic arms control is that um, it provides some very theoretical but still important dis distinction between nuclear war fighting and nuclear deterrence. I will dare to formulate it, uh, and of course, uh, it may be criticized by many other experts, but my definition is that the weapons which are limited in numbers and technical characteristics by arms control treaties are the weapons for deterrence. The weapons which are not limited in their numbers or technical characteristics are weapons for, war, for mostly for nuclear war fighting. Why is it so? Because those which are limited are limited on the agreement of both sides. I agree with you retaining a certain number of nuclear weapons with certain technical characteristics. That means I do not consider them a threat of first nuclear strike against myself and vice versa. So the distinction which is impossible to achieve within the logic of nuclear deterrence may be achieved through the logic of arms control. And finally, that is simple, that, that's a platitude that nothing is better than nuclear arms control uh, as an instrument of providing transparency, predictability, uh, of capabilities of the other side. That is something which is lacking in nuclear doctors, which as I mentioned initially, retain a big degree of uncertainty deliberately, allegedly to uh, enhance nuclear deterrence. Those uh, negotiations and treaties are the best way to understand real strategic thinking of the other side, because you know technical characteristics of weapon systems. You have intrusive inspections. You have permanent visits of um, experts of, uh, in the course of on-site inspection. There is no better way to understand the real strategic doctrine, concept, and operational planning, and to avoid miscalculation in, in, in case of a crisis. Of course, nuclear arms control is not uh, is not uh, uh, safe from contradictions of its own. Let me list a number of them. The experience of 50 years of negotiations and, treat and 10 treaties and agreements has shown 
many examples of such contradiction. Well, first of all, of course, politics and arms control. Domestic politics, foreign politics uh, regularly intrude on the process of arms control and uh, either prevent from reaching an agreement or prevent from ratifying an agreement. And you know the, the historic examples for that. But there is more to it than that, which is very interesting. When relations are very good, the uh, chances of nuclear arms control are not very good. In the end of the 90s and beginning of the 2000s, of the, of the next decade of the, of the 21st century, Russia and the United States had very good relations, close to ideal relations and cooperation. And everybody lost interest in strategic arms control. Uh, many people said, why do we need arms control? Britain and France do not have arms control because they are not enemies. And why should we have such treaties? And the arms control process got into prolonged stagnation. Uh, when relations are bad as they are now, people would say, uh, we cannot have strategic arms control or nuclear arms control in general because we do not trust each other. So uh, both extremes are bad for arms control. But uh, in response to that, I would repeat that the best way to enhance mutual trust is not to exchange compliments between the leaders. It's to reach agreements and to observe them very strictly. That is the basis for mutual trust. It would, it would not fall on us from the ceiling. Um, of course, um, the uh, reliable arms control depends on uh, profound uh, verification regime. And verification regime uh, is not omnipotent. It has its own limitations. For instance, during the 50 years of arms control, we were unable to limit certain weapon systems because verification regime would be too intrusive and too destructive for, na for, for national technical secrets. For instance, we were never able to limit the accuracy of nuclear weapons or to limit their destructive power uh, or to uh, limit sea-based uh, sea -based, uh, cruise missiles or to limit space uh, weapons, anti-satellite weapons, and so on and so forth. So the secrecy, verification, and nuclear arms control often come into contradiction uh, between each other. Still, the experience showed that with persistent process of nuclear arms control, you can broaden the verification boundaries and overcome many things, many secrets that were uh, not possible to uh, overcome uh, before. And, and last uh, controversy of uh, contradiction of arms control is that in reducing nuclear weapons, you have to be very careful about how deep you reduce nuclear weapons. Nuclear deterrence is based on the principle of um, um, that, that nuclear war is unthinkable because it is too destructive. So when you reduce nuclear weapons, you may reduce below the, uh, a certain level under which nuclear war becomes, becomes thinkable and nuclear deterrence becomes weaker. That is a very important technical and philosophical issue. It is not resolved up to now. It will have to be resolved in the future and I hope that sometime it will be resolved. Now with extension of uh, the New START Treaty, we have some time to reach the follow-on treaty. It will face uh, a lot of very difficult issues. I, will, I do not have time to discuss all of them. I'll just list them. Of course, reduction of strategic nuclear arms, further reduction. It will have to, have to happen because uh, public opinion and world public opinion expects some uh, additional reductions compared to the new start. A very controversial issue is limit on all arsenals of nuclear weapons, not only strategic, but also tactical. That is promising to be a major problem for the next start if the United States insists on doing something about that. Precision guided conventional systems and the threat of entanglement of strategic nuclear and strategic conventional systems. I mentioned it. Uh, this requires that we agree on limitation of some of precision guided conventional systems, in particular hypersonic ones which may acquire a capability of delivering the sounding strike, the sounding strike without uh, applying nuclear weapons, but with conventional systems only. 
space weapons are a serious problem. Cyber attack threat is even worse problem. And of course, ballistic missile defenses, which are acquiring a new life of its own uh, and uh, is being deployed by the United States and by Russia and which requires uh, some kind of uh, regulation. Well, that's almost all I wanted to say. Um, I will finalize my, my presentation uh, by saying that um, uh, nuclear deterrence without arms control is doomed to destroy strategic stability. There is no way to have stable nuclear deterrence without the process of arms control. Uh, you cannot cancel nuclear deterrence. It's a, 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 a crucial element of contemporary international relations and international security. But you have to insist on phased uh, nuclear arms control and non-proliferation efforts to keep nuclear deterrence at bay and to prevent it from destroying it, uh, itself and destroying the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rabata, for the presentation. Uh, colleagues, if, if you have questions, you can raise your hands and I'll, I'll call on you in the order um, as, as we continue the question and answer portion of, of this morning's lecture. Uh, Dr. Arbatov, I'd like to start with the, the first question um, that I have uh, after your presentation. And that is, um, um, imagine the US and Russia are, are sitting down to discuss strategic stability and uh, to start off the conversation, what historical precedents, positive and or negative um, from the Cold War should we discuss and, and agree on to establish a, a terms of reference for the dialogue? Response to your question is very easy. Uh, for the last three years, we had this consultations on strategic stability and the result was zero. Consultations on strategic stability uh, turn into a scholastic discussion without uh, simultaneously discussing practical strategic arms control. That is reduction and limitation of particular weapon systems, uh, which are of concern to each other. Okay, Th thank you very much. Um, I will uh, turn it over to Jasmine uh, for the first question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arbata, for your very um, informative presentation. Um, earlier in the, the presentation, you expressed concern over the possible rise of artificial intelligence as the final decision maker when it comes time to launch either first or second strike. So I was a little bit curious to hear more of your thoughts on this. What, in your opinion, is the likelihood of this happening? And what ways might actors employ to like what means might actors employ to reduce the likelihood of close calls or even something worse? Thank you. Artificial intelligence comes in different ways. For instance, automatic assessment of the information. Now the uh, gathering of, of information largely becomes an auto automatic process done by very sophisticated um, informational systems. Even in that, the human mind or political decision is greatly affected by this process, even without introducing artificial in, uh, intelligence uh, in the focal point of decision making. Um, other things like uh, um, growing automatization of um, uh, all operations because of the uh, deficit of time for uh, taking such decisions the speed of uh, contemporary weapon systems. Ballistic mi missiles are as fast as they were always, but the hypersonic systems, they may be small, slower than ballistic missiles, but, but their trajectory is unpredictable. And their warning time may be either very small or neg negligible at all, because after detection by satellites of the launch of site system, you lose track of it, and you do not know where it will hit until it hits you. Uh, so the shortening time uh, of decision-making um, is pushing towards more and more automatization, 
of information gathering, information assessment, of, uh, uh, of the whole process of implementing decisions taken by political leadership. And the time from both ends of warning and launch, uh, retaliatory launch of your own systems shrinks down to several minutes and, and in future maybe to seconds, which means that already we have an artificial intelligence, even if a president of Russia or the United States takes the final decision, but his or her decision will be determined by 100% of the, uh, of the informational systems that happen before that decision and provide with the few options that were designed by military planners long ago without ability to predict all, all the surprises of real crisis situations. And also this shrinking time will be uh, defined by the necess necessity to implement automatically coordinated response of all your various nuclear conventional space defensive and offensive global regional and other weapon systems which are now um, coming uh, uh, into the um, uh, uh, coming in deployment in deployment stage. Uh, the way to deal with that is first of all uh, to agree that um, shortening decision making time for political leaders is a very bad idea. That there is no necessity to be in such a rush to take decision on response either against nuclear or conventional attack. And in order to remove this incentive, you have to limit by arms control, by agreements, the systems which are exactly the systems which impose the technological uh, will on decision makers. That is hypersonic systems, um, uh, ballistic missiles with short flight time, uh, cyber attacks, space systems, which may destroy or disable command and control systems of each other. Thank you, Dr. Arbato. Um, John Stenko, uh, you can ask your question next. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Dr. Arbato, for your very insightful presentation this morning. Um, my name is John. I am a PhD student in international relations at Indiana University. And my question is, do you think, of course, so far, nuclear arms control has taken place in a, an international setting, either of, you know, a bipolar Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, or during a hegemonic period of you know, unipolar power for the United States? How much more difficult do you think it becomes to find this, this balance, this nuclear balance, given that we have all of these nuclear powers also trying to negotiate a new balance of power in the international world? Does that add an incredibly complicating factor or do you think that that's just part of normal operations and countries should be able to overcome that understanding the threat of nuclear destruction? In some sense, strategic um, relationship between Russia and the United States and strategic arms control is an exception to the idea of a polycentric world and to the idea of polycentric nuclear world. We now have nine nuclear weapon states, but the United States and Russia um, possess about 90% of all nuclear weapons uh, which um, exist in the world. So in this sense, it's easier to pursue in a bilateral way. But certain nuclear weapon states, and there were non-nuclear weapon states, certainly create problems. In particular, China, which is uh, developing quickly its uh, um, medium range and strategic uh, potential, strategic systems, nuclear and conventional, and which already makes the United States uh, very cautious about proceeding with strategic arms control because the United States uh, cannot involve China in arms control of the United States and China because the potentials are very uh, unequal. China is still very inferior to the United States. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, the United States is, in, is cautious in limiting the systems at negotiations with Russia, which might be needed to use against China for deterrence or, if necessary, for war fighting. Uh, also, the United States is cautious about um, reducing the uh, force levels so much that China acquires a real ch chance to gain some equality with the United States. Russia has the same concerns about Britain and France, in particular Britain, which recently has declared that it's going to uh, raise the ceiling on its uh, nuclear uh, potential. Uh, the ceiling is not, uh, still is not very high, but the precedent is set and Russia can no longer let, rely on the notion that Britain has a finite limited nuclear deterrence. Uh, who can give a guarantee that in a couple of years, the ceiling will be not raised higher and higher and higher. And so reducing strategic nuclear forces uh, of Russia on an equal footing with the United States will make Britain and in some respect France uh, a, a very tangible addition to NATO nuclear capability which Russia has to face. Uh, so those nuclear weapon states uh, certainly make arms control much more difficult, uh, even though they are still incomparable to the two nuclear superpowers in the numbers and quality of their nuclear forces. And development of ballistic missiles and conventional systems and hypersonic weapons by third states, in particular China, um, creates a serious incentive, uh, in particular for the United States, to pursue with ballistic missile defenses, which Russia perceives as a destabilizing factor in U.S.-Russian strategic relationship and U.S.-Russian strategic arms control. So, polycentric world imposes its difficulties um on the process that is familiar to us by the preceding 50 years of history of strategic arms control nonetheless i'm sure that uh with reasonable thinking uh, politicians can resolve those issues for example americans are uh, trying to engage china in some kind of arms control and are indignant about the fact that china declines or such proposals when I'm talking to my American friends and colleagues, I'm telling them, have you proposed to China any kind of agreement that would make Chinese strategic position better than otherwise? Have you proposed to China any kind of agreement that would not make China legally inferior to the United States in those weapon systems that would be subject of such agreement? Neither. Neither one or the other task was resolved by the United States. So I think that Americans have to work much harder if they want really to engage China in some kind of arms control and make Russian US arms control easier. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Arbatov. And uh, Connor, you, you may ask your question next. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Dr. Arbatov, for your. Uh, discussion today on nuclear arms control. My name is Connor Cunningham, and I'm a recent graduate uh, from the University of Washington in Seattle. My question has to do with cybersecurity, um, and I was wondering to what extent do you think uh, cybersecurity should play into any future uh, agreements uh, on arms control, particularly between the United States and Russia? Very Thank good you. question, and uh, recently, Russian and American president even engaged in a special direct line discussing cybersecurity. As a fashionable thing, it has come to the foreground, even ahead of nuclear weapons, which I think is wrong. Uh, but nonetheless, it is an important issue. The only thing which uh, should not be done is to include cybersecurity within the agenda of follow-on start, start follow-on negotiations, because this is this very esoteric area. It's not clear uh, how things are developing there, what effect, what particular effect 
uh, cyber threat may have on strategic stability. So we should deal with that in a separate parallel uh, channel of negotiations involving the best available experts, military and civilian that we have. Uh, for the foreseeable future, I think we cannot hope for any practical technical agreements to limit cybersecurity. But uh, we could try to achieve some, some kind of other uh, agreement. For instance, taking um, binding political commitments uh, by Russia and the United States not to use cyber attacks against strategic command control systems and early warning systems of each other. That would hardly be uh, technically verifiable, but it certainly relies on common interest because preserving the validity of our command and control systems is a mutual interest to avoid inadvertent or spontaneous nuclear war and to cooperate in preventing provocative cyber attacks by third parties to um, instigate such a collision between Russia and the United States. We could use here the example of an agreement that was reached many years ago that we do not target ballistic nuclear missiles on each other. That was an agreement reached and, and uh, that was a declaration that was made. We do not have ability to verify it, but it still exists and uh, as far as I know is being observed and uh, provide some measure of uh, strategic stability to our relationship. Thank you. And uh, Sean, uh, you're, you're up next. Thanks, Alex. And thank you, Dr. Abadov, for a really interesting discussion. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm a master's student at Harvard University. And I was basically just wondering, um, you spoke about the US being unwilling to engage China on sort of equal terms um, uh, in, in strategic arms control. I was wondering if you think that there's any capacity or incentive or future of uh, Russia bilaterally engaging China on strategic arms control. Thank you. Well, maybe some time in a more distant future, yes, but uh, not in the foreseeable future, because um, uh, in light of what Chinese and Russian leaders say about Russia-Chinese relations, uh, we have a, a strategic partnership and we have we do not have mutual nuclear deterrence relationship uh, between each other between us that is why if we do not have a mutual nuclear deterrence relationship there is no way for russia to trade some of its weapon systems for chinese weapon systems they are not in a relationship to trade concessions on this matter uh, that is how traditionally arms control was conducted during the last uh, 50 years between Russia and the United States. Uh, between, I, uh, I, my personal opinion is that Russia should not be indifferent to what China does with its uh, missile forces and nuclear forces of various kinds, because as the history uh, teaches us, uh, political relations change, but nuclear weapons stay. And um, uh, since Russia has very peculiar relations with China, you know very well the features of this relationship, uh, we should uh, not uh, be complacent to the way China is developing and deploying its um, strategic nuclear and conventional arsenal. Still, I do not think our negotiations are possible, but I would very strongly advise the Russian government to encourage China to enter such negotiations with the United States. That would certainly make Russian strategic and security situation easier. I would even go as far as to advise our foreign ministry to propose some models of uh, possible agreements between China and the United States. But that may be, maybe I'm too ambitious of that. Thank you. Um, Jack, I see your hand. Um, since my next question is uh, re related to this one, I'm, I'm going to ask another one uh, at this time. Uh, doc, doc, Dr. Arbatov, so uh, on, on this topic of there being potential for a multilateral uh, nuclear arms control 
um, in the future, even if this started bilaterally, could, could it be possible for the US and Russia to, to, to start something that could eventually be spread multilaterally, even if there's no engagement with China now, but it sets the, the ceiling or the precedent that um, as China approaches parity, they, they would uh, be able to, to join a multilateral agreement. And then also uh, that other nuclear states could, could be party to. Is something like that workable if it starts out bilaterally? Well, it has started bilaterally 50 years ago. So it's a, a, a process with a, with a, with a long history uh, between Russia, Soviet Union and the United States, now Russia and the United States. Um, in some very particular areas, yes, I think multilateral strategic arms control is possible. For instance, limiting anti-satellite systems. Russia and the United States have them, China has it. Uh, all three are interested in providing for security of their uh, space-based assets. We might uh, have a trilateral dialogue on some limitations on uh, anti-satellite systems, for instance, uh, prohibiting their tests against real targets in space, which besides being uh, bad as a development of anti-satellite capability, also is producing a lot of debris, which are threatening in peacetime to all um, low orbit satellites of all countries which are uh, spacefaring countries. Uh, but uh, in the core uh, area of nuclear arms control, strategic arms control, I do not think we can turn bilateral process into multilateral. Uh, for, because, of, because such arms control depends on mutual interest and mutual concessions on limiting weapon systems. So it implies relationship of mutual nuclear deterrence. There, are, there is no such relationship between France and Britain, France and Britain and the United States, all those three and Israel and India. Uh, likewise, there is no such relationship between um, the Soviet uh, Russia and China, Russia and India. Uh, in some respect, Russia and Israel as well. So, uh, and, and the second element is uh, equality. Not because equality is a uh, sine qua non for deterrence, but because neither side would agree to legalize its inferiority in the systems which are subject to agreement. And that is why equality. We have equal settings of the new start, not because we need particularly that number of systems and that number of equality. And in fact, our real, uh, forces are not uh, so equal, they're rather asymmetric. But um, for the uh, international law, for the legal reasons, uh, some equality is necessary as a starting point of negotiations and as the ending point of negotiations, hopefully at lower uh, levels of, um, of weapons. Of weapons. Um, so I think that the prospect for multilateral arms control is uh, not expanding the membership of the negotiating forum, but expanding the number of such forums. For instance, there is reason to, uh, to hope for possibility of such negotiations between India and Pakistan. They, are, they have strategic parity and they have uh, relations of mutual nuclear deterrence. So the te technically, it's a classic situation for strategic arms control but for their political tensions, their inequality in conventional forces, and the factor of China, which for India is much more important and threatening than the factor of Pakistan. Um, possibly in, in some future, there may be a reason for uh, nuclear arms control between Russia on the one hand and Britain and France on the other hand. There is no equality now, but there is mutual nuclear deterrence in the relationship. So we might try to find some ways to, to reach at least initially um, politically binding agreements for, for them not to increase their nuclear forces and to provide some measure of uh, transparency with on-site inspections, with exchange of information, and for Russia to reduce its uh, strategic and medium range nuclear forces um, uh, to uh, 
uh, to make uh, those two states feel more secure. Um, and of course, as when we're talking about non-proliferation, uh, nuclear tests, um, stopping uh, production of fissile materials, and many other uh, areas of nuclear arms control, which are not uh, directly reducing weapons and weapon systems, then there is place for uh, many countries. Uh, and in fact, treaties of their kind are already not multilateral. Thank, thank you, Dr. Bata, for that answer. Um, up next is Jack. Thanks, Alex. Um, my name is Jack McClelland. I'm a master's student at McGill University. Um, Dr. Arbatov, I wanted to ask if you believe climate change is or will have any effect on nuclear deterrence, arms control, or strategic stability. Mm, frankly speaking, I have not thought about it. Uh, but as my teacher in college said, everything is connected to everything. So possibly uh, in some respects, in some future time, there will be some uh, relationship. In particular, the, uh, for Russia, the climate change and melting of permafrost creates enormous problems for Russian military infrastructure and particularly in the North. And in the North, uh, we have um, the major part of uh, sea-based deterrent force uh, all kinds of uh, military uh, installations. So this climate change will certainly affect it. But otherwise, um, it would require more time and more imagination on my part to provide you with more definite answer. Thank you. And uh, Nadia, please, your question next. Yes, thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Abada, for, for the talk and for your time. Uh, my name is Nadia. I'm a student, master's student at the University of Oxford. I have kind of a general question, but I'm genuinely interested. Um, being a student myself, I would like to ask you, what do you think is lacking now in training of future nuclear arms control experts in both countries, either in the United States and in Russia? What do you think is lacking in their training? If there is something, <laughs> thank you. Oh yeah, sure. Um, since I'm dealing with that uh, in a direct and very practical way, I can tell you that the main thing which is lacking is the highest priority dedicated to the subject by political leadership and political elites. Uh, in the Cold War was very bad, but uh, the priority of nuclear arms controls, once it started, was very high on the agenda of both uh, Russian, uh, Soviet, and American political leaderships. And when the time has come for, for a Gorbachev period, when not only priority was high, but the willingness to, to find compromise was high, then we achieved um, real breakthroughs in nuclear and conventional arms control, INF Treaty, Start one, uh, conventional force reductions in Europe and a number of other very important agreements, unilateral uh, parallel uh, reductions of tactical nuclear weapons by an order of magnitude. So uh, that that is number one, which is which is needed. Number two, uh, which depends on the first uh, on the first point, is the funding of such studies or special faculties of creating uh, serious programs in which this multi multi uh, uh, multi-dimensional subject would be studied by young people by students and some postgraduates because uh, we need special courses on that which would combine technical knowledge mathematical knowledge uh, economics, uh, military science, uh, no, no knowledge of uh, uh, international law, knowledge of history, knowledge of uh, strategic thinking and strategic doctrines, all that has to come in a package that requires a very big and profound and persistent course to train young, young people, young people in this particular area. So it requires political encouragement 
and incentives so that young people going there will know that uh, they will not have to search for work after college. They will be uh, in great demand. Secondly, uh, what we need is funding. And third, what we need is expertise on the part of faculty professors, uh, teachers in colleges and universities that would uh, elaborate this very sophisticated, broad education um, program for students in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arbatov. Um, if, if I could add to, to that, I, I think that program sounds like a great opportunity for exchange. I know uh, US, there was a brief period of time where US military officers would uh, do an exchange program at McGimo. And I, I think um, the more that we had uh, those kinds of programs um, uh, starting again, I think that would be that would be really beneficial. But uh, that's uh, my my two cents. I, I wish that we could we could do we could do more of that. Um, we had a question. Agree more. My thank you. My my question. Uh, next question came from uh, the Facebook live stream. So this is not a member of the symposium, but um, related to a previous statement you made. I'm going to paraphrase the question. Um, you had said that we don't necessarily need to expand the forum for discussing arms control, but expand the number of forums. And so uh, th this question was about uh, what role could, um, could, could third parties like Japan play in helping create uh, more, more forums uh, for these types of discussions. Um, so that one specifically for the Pacific. But um, can you comment on, on how we can expand the, the number of forums for, for, for this uh, effort? Well, I didn't mean, uh, I didn't mean uh, infinite expense, expanding of, of, of the number of forums. I meant particular forums, which would be, first of all, important, necessary, and secondly, would be realistically um, achievable. Uh, with respect to Japan, uh, whenever you're asking about is it Japan or any other country, um, the forum in which they could participate and uh, produce their influence should depend on their political state, whether nuclear or non-nuclear, uh, what kind of non-nuclear, how sophisticated. For instance, I think that sometime in the future, if we have uh, negotiations between the United States and China, on, um, uh, on strategic arms control in the Pacific, Japan could participate being an important American ally and potentially base for um, American uh, regional ballistic missile defenses and possessor of uh, sea-based ballistic missile defenses of its own. So uh, that might be the route for Japan to this domain. Okay, thank you very much. Um, no, for any other fellows, if you um, had a second question or any anything else that you wanted to uh, to ask, I want to make sure I give you the opportunity to do so. Uh, Sophie, please. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Dr. Abatov. That has been a very interesting lecture and uh, conversation. Uh, thank you for all the fellows. Uh, thanks to all the fellows who asked fascinating questions. I myself wanted to ask a question on uh, AI in the very beginning, and then uh, somebody asked a very similar one, which is why I had to uh, reconsider. Um, um, I am a student at the University of Oxford. My name is Sophie. I'm studying for an MPhil in Russian and East European Studies. Um, and I was wondering to what extent, um, being a political scientist by training, I connected the uh, AI, which um, as you uh, elaborated on, could uh, potentially even um, allow for a first strike being made by uh, an artificial intelligence uh, decision. To what extent um, the increased usage of the artificial intelligence in this field could potentially create uh, a, leg a legitimacy problem because uh, if the strike is dependent on uh, how fast uh, the respective AI can gather information, uh, then there won't be time for the politicians to convene and uh, to decide on uh, striking or not striking. And then potentially the AI would do it and uh, who then 
um, bears the responsibility for what happens. Thank you. Well, it's a very serious legal problem, but it's not new. We already have been facing this problem with drones, uh, which are being extensively used in local conflicts. And in the future, we may witness uh, deployment of strategic drones, even, even strategic drones with nuclear weapons, and we will face the same problem again. Um, many autonomous weapon systems, which are in the, in the development now, for instance, Russian this uh, underwater super torpedo, which is named Poseidon, probably would have some elements of artificial intelligence because it would be very difficult uh, to keep contact with this weapon system once it is far away in the ocean. Um, with respect to legal uh, aspects of that, this is a special field and uh, experts on uh, law are studying it. But I think that in principle, uh, such um, devices, such uh, arrangements of uh, uh, artificial intelligence deciding on the fate of mankind is morally uh, unacceptable and technically very, uh, very, uh, very threatening, uh, very dangerous. Um, otherwise, uh, I think that uh, from the uh, purely by legal norms, uh, this problem cannot be resolved. It has to be resolved through uh, political understanding, uh, through the understanding of political leaders and uh, through uh, practical negotiations on the weapon systems which may be using uh, artificial intelligence in and of themselves and weapon systems which induce the usage of artificial intelligence at the upper structures of uh, political decision making. Uh, thank you, Sophie, for your question. Thank you, Dr. Arbantov. Um, that, that's all the time that we have for our session. Un unfortunately, it's, uh, it's already come to an end, but I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for, for a, a great lecture and for um, the answers to the, uh, all of the questions that we had. Uh, my, my notebook is full of things to take away from this. So I'm, I'm very grateful and, uh, and wish you the best. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention your interest in these matters. And uh, again, thank you to Professor Vasilieva because she made this uh, kind of conferences possible with her um, enormous dedication and her efforts for many years. <laughs>